Good morning and welcome to the Entrepreneurva Founder Webcast. I am Tom Clement from Minnesota State University, Mankato, and I'm here with my co-host Inga De Drew. Hello. Uh, she, she is in the Netherlands. And um, so I am going to sort of do a little bit of hosting today, which Inga normally does. And the reason I'm doing that is because this is really Inga's wheelhouse right here. We're talking about gaming and play and how those two concepts can fit into building great startups. And even once the startup is going, being more creative about how you approach the day-to-day -day operations. So uh, Inga is going to talk a lot about the gaming side of things because that's obviously her sort of specialty because she invented the playground for entrepreneurs and that is her company and that is her her whole world right now, basically outside of her outside of her personal life. So, um, and I'm going to sort of approach it from both the play and a gaming perspective because I teach that content in my creativity and innovation course. Uh, we talk a lot about play and I sort of incorporate it also with make believe and and sort of the different creative elements that a lot of children have that we sort of as they get older we sort of almost shame them into not being creative anymore uh from that perspective so uh inga you have a great story to lead us off about microsoft so why don't you introduce yourself quick and uh and talk about that yes let's um so i'll introduce myself my name is inga de Dreug. Um, I uh, have been an entrepreneurship coach and also an educator in universities, both in Colombia and in the Netherlands. I used to live in Colombia and now I live in the Netherlands again. Um, and from that experience, I've created Playground for Entrepreneurs, which is a serious game for coaches and educators, entrepreneurship coaches and educators to use with their participants or with their students. So, um, Actually, there is a Q&A event coming up if you are interested next week. Um, so that's basically what, what I'm doing right now and also my link with serious games and, and gamification. You want to present yourself first, Tom, before going to the Microsoft story? Uh, as I said, I'm Tom Clement. I teach uh, okay. entrepreneurship and innovation at Minnesota State University, Mankato, which we're about an hour south of Minneapolis, St. Paul, if you're familiar with that in the United States. Um, by the way, happy uh, Labor Day in the United States to everybody out there. Um, it's kind of a melancholy day for a lot of people because kids go back to school tomorrow in a lot of parts of the United States. And I know in Minnesota, where I live, we have the state fair going on right now. And, that, and today is the last day of the state fair. So we sort of shift into fall mode now uh, once Labor Day is over in the United States. That's sort of like our tipping point. Uh, where we start thinking about fall and and the leaves changing and college football and all these different things that start happening this time of year um, in the United States. So you sent me an interesting little snippet uh, in a chat that we were having on LinkedIn about Microsoft that I did not know, and it was a super interesting story. So why don't you tell us about that, Inga? Yeah, so uh, I'm sure that everybody over... 30, 35 maybe, uh, who's on this uh, live stream can remember Solitaire or Minesweeper and have probably played it quite often at the start of the computer days. And um, those, were, those games were actually added by Microsoft to teach people how to use a mouse, right? So you would use Solitaire and if you play Solitaire then you drag and drop, you drag and drop because before that, people were not taking the mouse seriously, right? They would, they didn't know what to do with it. They had all these commands and they had uh, trackballs and joysticks and things like that, but they didn't know what to really do with the mouse. Now, of course, in a world like this, we can't imagine that being the case anymore, <laughs> right? So that's basically what uh, solitaire or patience has taught us and then they used minesweeper to teach us how to left click and right click what would be the use of clicking left and clicking right so that's a very interesting story because they used that game to teach us something and we didn't even know right it was gamification without even mentioning that it was gamification people thought it was just for entertainment purposes 
right? And we take that for granted because the original mouse that was designed for Apple by the IDEO folks out in Silicon Valley was just a one button mouse. And it was strictly just a, a just a navigate around the screen tool at the time. Because before, you know, I don't know how many of us oldsters can remember using the up and down and left and right arrows to move around on the screen. We didn't have that ability. And then, of course, they came out with the trackball later on, which was, you know, the little ball that you would move around with the palm of your hand. And that was how you would navigate. And then that hit, that had a clicking button on it. So when you got where you wanted to go and you wanted to stop, you could click. But, you know... The left and right button mouse that that Microsoft sort of pioneered um, that was a real learning experience for a lot of people. Um, it wasn't something that they were used to. And even me today, you know, we use the left button most of the time. Um, I have to think sometimes I've got a right button over there and there are functions there. Uh, so we get so locked into our groove sometimes um, that it's really interesting that Microsoft chose to put a game on there that's really become quite addictive. I mean, my wife plays solitaire on the computer constantly, uh, but that was really designed initially to help us get used to uh, a technology tool that they'd come up with yeah. And, yeah. and a device essentially. It, it worked. It did work very <laughs> well. I'll take one second to say hello to some of our folks joining us on the chat, by the way. Uh, Bilal was mentioning that he has a paper that he wrote on gamification that's under review right now. So congratulations, that's huge. Um, I've got a paper under review right now myself and I know what uh, that can be a long waiting game. Uh, good morning to Mike Hahn, he always joins us. Uh, Stephen Rice joins us as well. Um, and talking about how you know we can push entrepreneurship beyond the boundaries of business uh, in a bunch of different directions. And this is one of the things we're sort of talking about today is using something kind of outside the box um, to help push those boundaries. So talk a little bit about gamification in general as it as it applies to entrepreneurship. Yeah, let's let's start with the basics. So uh, there is a classic uh, a classic writer, Johan Huizinga. He's actually Dutch, uh, but he's a classic writer who defines a game as a separate space and time with a separate objective. Um, and that really helps to uh, lower the stakes and facilitate experimentation. That's um, a couple of things that he says about gamification. And that's really interesting, which I found in my experience as well, because as soon as you lower the stakes, as soon as you create a psychologically safe environment, so we're playing, right? right. So the purpose of the game is to come up with new things and to come up with experiments then uh, you get people to uh, to share in a very different way. And for entrepreneurship, that has been very useful. Now, there's a couple of related areas, like, for example, innovation. Innovation is using a lot of games, right? There's a lot of brainstorm games. There's a lot of creativity games. There's a lot of experimentation going on using games to interact with people. Um, innovation has a lot of games as such. Now, I still find that a lot of entrepreneurship people, a lot of uh, uh, directors or people who work in incubators or in uh, accelerators, they pride themselves on their seriousness. And of course, being serious about people's ambitions is great. Right. But sometimes the play environment in which you can kind of set a space, a separate space and time with a different dimension, with different rules just for that separate space and time that really helps for people to experiment with new things and with new sharing right so for example that sort of environment if people find challenges in their venture in whatever they're creating that's really useful to share because then people can join and help right there's this tension between collaborative games and competitive games now, in my experience, this should be kind of balanced, at least in the entrepreneurial sense. You don't want to get too competitive because then people will really kind of fight with each other. You, you want them to collaborate <laughs> to a certain extent. Uh, with the playground, my experience has been like competition is competition with yourself, really. Right? You and you a couple of weeks ago or a couple of months ago. 
right? How much better are you right now with your venture, with your idea? That's the competition that you want to create rather than a competition between people, because then you get different ideas. You get different people with different skills. Well, that's, that's not something that's necessarily constructively competitive. Right. Competing with yourself is. So that's, that's an important variable. I just well, and, and if, if there's people out there like me, I am my worst critic in a lot of cases. And, you know, I even treat things like, I mean, I'm a professor and I have, you know, I'm, I'm asked to do research and I like to do research. And, and as a result, I write a lot of papers and even getting better at writing over time. Um, I've sort of treated it as a little bit of a game and you watch yourself improve over, over a period of years or months or whatever. And you just do that, uh, by being your own critic. And sometimes that can be a negative where people are a little too hard on themselves. Uh, but if you can turn it into sort of a game with yourself and have those competitive juices with your own, um, past accomplishments, yeah. you know, it can really help you improve as an individual in a variety of different ways. Um, you know, I think one of the, one of the worst things that, well, I, sh I shouldn't say worse. It was probably the best thing that ever happened to a lot of us during COVID was doing Zoom to teach, using Zoom to teach because we could watch ourselves teach. <laughs> and you realized all these horrible foibles that you have, all the, and I have lots of bad habits anyway. I'm a hand waver and, you know, all these quirky little things that you do. But um, if you treat that sort of from a play or game perspective, and just try to improve on yourself and get better over time. You see a lot of companies in the United States now, and I'm sure they have them all over the world. Uh, there's firms like Mathnasium, for example, that that works to teach young grade school kids better math skills. They use a lot of gamification, a lot of play to help do that. And so instead of using a very strict instructional approach like you might use in a classroom, they just take a little bit different approach to it, and it, help, it tends to help the students uh, yeah. not only compete with themselves, but sort of compete with the game structure that they use. Yes. In those yeah. types of environment. They've been, they've been very, very successful at it. Now, so another thing that's very useful about games is that it really builds relationships, right? So very often people remember the games that they played because it's a very memorable experience. They, uh, um, it might be child games, but it also might be games when they're adults or gamified games it's something that they remember because it stood out somehow and people tend to connect with each other over a longer term so and that's really great that's another very big advantage for entrepreneurship because entrepreneurs need other entrepreneurs as a way to build their venture and to kind of go through that process together they need that peer type of environment sometimes it's feedback sometimes it's just friendship uh, sometimes it helps build resilience because you've got more resilience when you're together right. uh, there's very many advantages to actually building out relationships uh, during times of entrepreneurship and building out your your ideas it's a bonding experience really and and you know in america we have american thanksgiving and it's very common a lot of families and you'll see them out in the front yards they have their their traditional Thanksgiving Day football game where they all go out as a family and play football in the yard or maybe in Europe it's soccer, you know, on a certain day where they all play together. And it's a bonding experience and we bond over play and we bond over games uh, many times, you know, whether it's uh, my wife is a big card player. She loves to play different card games with and, and when she goes home to see her, her sisters and her mom and folks like that, that's what they do. That's what they bond over is, is, uh, uh, you know, card card playing and 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 it's more about the camaraderie than it is about the game. Uh, but there's also those competitive yeah. juices there, for sure. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm going to talk a little bit about play and how I incorporate it. So I teach a creativity and innovation course uh, as a as a professor, and I'm primarily an entrepreneurship professor. That's kind of what I do. But this creativity and innovation class is really a generalist class for all management students. Um, so I not only get entrepreneurship students taking it, but I get students that are going to just go out in the working world and work as a work as a manager in a company. And so I spend some time talking about play and gaming. And one of the quotes that I've 
integrated into the courses by the philosopher Plato. And it's, you can discover more about a person in an hour of play than in a year of conversation. And when I first read that, I really reflected on that quote and thought about it a little bit. And I came up with an activity for my students that I call the hour of play. So I am fairly convinced that in the job interview and hiring process, we've got a lot of flaws. First of all, it's a very expensive process, especially if you're bringing people in from remote areas, flying them in, putting them up in motels, uh, going through that whole process. It can be quite an expensive process to hire people. And unfortunately, our turnover rate uh, is not good in, in a lot of cases. And I think we need to learn as much as we can about the folks that we're thinking about hiring through a variety of different ways. And, and the traditional job interview where we sort of bring an individual in and we set them down in front of a group of people sort of under the hot lights, if you will, and we just batter them with questions. Um, that's sort of run its course in a lot of ventures. I'm not saying you still shouldn't do some version of that, but what I challenge my students to do is let's come up with a play experience. And I put a 60 minute time limit on it. It wouldn't have to be that short, but I just said, let's, let's design a one hour play experience that's going to show the hiring side of it, everything they need to know about an individual when they're put in a competitive or, or play type of circumstance. And you can learn a lot about people that way. Some of the things you learn about people aren't always so great. Um, you're going to get people that are going to always try to sidetrack the rules or sidestep the rules. Um, you get some people that unfortunately lose their temper when they're put into a situation where they're maybe losing in a game or they become very overly competitive. Uh, competition is a good thing and being competitive is a good thing, but sometimes that can be pushed too far. So, yeah. for example, if you're working in a company where you're a fiduciary and you're dealing with financial uh, situations and responsibilities with your clients, or maybe you're working in an environment where there's a lot of intellectual property involved and you have to be very uh, secretive and discreet about what you reveal to people, um, you could discover a lot of that by having individuals go through a game scenario in their job interview process. Obviously, we want to design games that are um, adaptable to a lot of different people. Um, you know, the example I was talking about earlier, you probably wouldn't want to do like a pickup basketball game or anything like that. Because not everybody's, you know, I have two left feet and two left hands. I can't even dribble a basketball, even though I love sports. So I would fail that test miserably right off the bat. But there's lots of different game situations things like your board game or uh, different outside games that you could have that are fun, but also show us a lot about the individual that we're interviewing uh, yep. and might tell us a lot more about that person than just sitting them down and grilling them for a half an hour or an hour uh, in a Q&A session. Not to say that we should eliminate that completely, but this is something else that you could integrate into That's that process. Definitely. It, it really, really qu quickly uh, shows you a lot of aspects about, about the person. I totally agree. Um, so there's a lot of added values of gamification, about serious games. Uh, and now let's talk a bit about the negative side, because we can't deny there's a lot of games that sometimes don't seem to make sense, at right. least <laughs> to me, <laughs> right? So one of the biggest risks I find with gamification is that um, sometimes people tend to think that it's just adding a couple of points and a couple of badges and then it's a game, right? right. Not so much. And um, people will find out. So a game uh, is intrinsically motivating. It's helping people, and if we talk about entrepreneurship, this setting of entrepreneurship, that's something that people are intrinsically motivated anyway. So playing a game should just add to that. Um, but just adding a couple of points and a couple of badges is not going to do a lot if there is no idea behind it, right? Right. So I'm all for gamification, but there should be really a concept behind it, a why of why would I do this? Why would I want to 
involve myself in this game, right? Rather than just adding a couple of points and a leaderboard. So superficiality. And uh, there is a term that they're using nowadays quite a lot in the Netherlands in, in gamification professionals, which is chocolate covered broccoli, right? <laughs> so if you have something that's that's has one taste and probably a lot of people don't like it. <laughs> You can cover it up with something that people absolutely love, but people will taste the broccoli anyway. And it's not a good combination, <laughs> right? right? So if you take the chocolate off, then the broccoli might still be broccoli, but it's still better than when it's covered with chocolate. <laughs> so there's a lot of things that people may not intrinsically enjoy, right? So if we're talking about filling out your tax papers, not something that you would particularly enjoy for the most people. So you can gamify that, but well, people will kind of find out, right? So it's the obvious. Little, little layer of chocolate is not going to help that. And the combination might be worse off than the broccoli in the first, in the first place. So that's something important to take into account. The game should have a right of existence for itself rather than just camouflage something that some people will not enjoy. And I think it's important to, to think about the creativity of the player and their ability to be able to use that creativity, <clears throat> excuse me, to play the game. And one thing we talked about earlier, you know, we were discussing simulations, for example, in college courses, like you take an entrepreneurship class or you take a uh, maybe a management strategy course. There's a lot of simulations uh, that are available. Uh, some are sold through the book publishers and, and different companies like that. But so much of that turns into gaming the game. Yeah. So you're not really playing the game. They're all, you know, a lot of the students will go out on the, on the internet and look for hacks for ways to sort of sidestep the game, to game the game essentially. And you could make the argument, I suppose, that they're still playing the game but they're not really playing it with their own creativity. They're playing it with somebody else's creativity or somebody yep. else's ideas or somebody else's shortcuts um, yep. that they've been able to come up with to try to sort of step around the rules or, hey, here's what you need to do to win this game for sure. Um, so that's the other side of it. I think we need to concentrate on creating games that really test the person's creativity uh, and the way that they problem solve and the way that they reason their way through the game as opposed to just going out and looking up what everybody else has done yeah. to win the game. That's, that's probably, if you take one of the most popular games of all time, Monopoly, right? Right. You can look it up, right? You can look up the playing strategies, but still people play it because they want to. Right? So you can look up the playing strategies, but still, that's... the the strongest part is the intrinsic motivation of entertainment, whether you, you're very competitive and you want to win or you just want to have a good time with your family, but still people play it just by themselves with their own creative ideas and their own creative strategies of it. So that's how good the game should be rather than gaming the game, as, as you mentioned. Yeah. Why don't you talk about the finite and infinite uh, gaming uh, yeah. possibilities too? That was a really interesting thing we discussed before yeah. before today's webcast. Definitely. First, I want to uh, ask the people watching if there is any question or any comments, please let us know in the chat For sure. uh, so we can uh, respond to it. I see that uh, Yasir um, is very grateful to see our slogan. Thank you, Yasir. It's, it's been interesting to uh, develop the slogan. <laughs> um, so if you have any question or any comments or you just want to say hi, uh, please let us know in the chat. Uh, we still have another couple of minutes to go, so please do so, uh, so we can address it. So talking about finite and infinite games, which is something that, um, for example, Simon Sinek talks about a lot. Um, finite games are games where you know the objective. You know the objective of the game, you know the competitors, 
you know their objectives and there's a, a there's an end of the game there's a finish of the game and then you will know the winner of the game right that's a finite game then there's the infinite game the infinite game you don't know the competitors very unexpected circumstances may come up uh, you don't know the objective. The ob your objective might be very different to your competitor's objective. And that's basically the game that we're playing in entrepreneurship, but also in life. Uh, it's also, for example, uh, traditional economics, right? Because competitors may come in, circumstances may change. And we have a very big example the last couple of years with COVID coming in. Right? Who could have predicted the impact that that would have on all sorts of businesses and on people's lives? So you don't know who's in the market. There's no fixed time frame. There is no fixed objective. And circumstances and objectives may change and may vary. And the amount of uncertainty is just very big. That's an infinite game. So taking that into account, we kind of have to play with the idea, um, finite or infinite. And what I'm, for example, trying to do with the playground is to take a piece of it. And that's it's for the moment for the two hour playing session, it might be a finite. But after that, it will still be an infinite game for the participants because they take away their feedback, their, they take away their insights, and that's what we're, they're going to work with. So they're going back to the infinite game because that's what's like the, the, the permanent, the continuous uh, thing that's going on with their ventures and with their ideas. Right. It's a very oh, interesting. Go ahead. It's a, it's a very interesting concept to think about how to use both finite and infinite uh, uh, games to your advantage to really see what's what's in your playing field and how you can interact with that consciously the more consciously you do that the more the better you can move in that type of environment as well well and i think you make a really interesting point um where it's not an either or a lot of times either uh you know it's not a, it's not a pick one or pick the other it's a lot of times it's both combined so you brought up an example where you're working in a finite space, but the results are are infinite. Uh, in the, in the case of your of your uh, entrepreneurship game, but you know, you think about like a sports analogy. You have a very finite outcome. You have so many. You know, in soccer. I know they offer like extended time and things like that, but you definitely have a time frame that you have to work within. And then the ultimate outcome is you want to score more points than your competitor. But within the game itself, the possibilities are infinite. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of times, you know, you take uh, American football as an example, uh, where you show up with a game plan and maybe the other team has got your game plan figured out. And now you need to start getting very infinite in how you approach that process because you've got a lot of different options at your disposal. But again, you've got that very finite outcome at the end. Um, so it's important to think about it from an infinite and finite perspective, but know that it's not an either or. Yeah. Uh, that there can be both combined into one game. Yes. It's yeah. important. And that's, so, a, that's a really great point to make. Yes. So I see a couple of people in the chat, uh, Willie, saying hi. Oh, hi, boy, Willie. Mike is getting really old school. He's talking about Pac-Man and Galaga and Frogger. Holy cow. That, yes. that takes me back. I'll bring one more into that asteroids. That was my favorite video game when I was in when I was in junior high. So uh, let's take the question that he's asking at the end of of the message: Is gaming at home fostering a society of, of introverts? And that's an interesting question because you can argue both for and against it. Right, so gaming, and there are schools using Minecraft, for example, to craft their cur curriculums, and that is just uh, well very engaging for young people, very revolutionary. Minecraft was never designed to do that, um, and it's obviously also fostering the relationships between their students. So you could argue for and against. I guess that it's all about uh, uh, 
finding the balance and using the game to be to develop social skills rather than to take them away. Um, I well, think that, that's are the there more introverts today? I, I would say there probably are, but I would also argue that there's always been introverts, yeah. and whether it was gaming or when I was younger and there weren't as many games, video games, and 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 things like that. It was reading. Uh, you know, you used to, used to have the kids that we went to school with that we would call the bookworms or whatever that were constantly reading. That was their introversion. That was the way that they escaped from the world. Um, so, yeah, there's probably as a percentage, there might be a few more um, introverts than there used to be, you know, say 30 years ago. But I would say there's always been a fairly good chunk of society that would consider themselves to be introverts. It just it's just how they chose to uh, approach that introversion, I guess, or that way that of crawling into themselves, if you will. We've got a couple more questions here. What would be your right. choice for a finite game or infinite mm -hmm. game solving challenges all the time? Well, I would say I would say infinite because it's always coming at you and everything's changing all the time. But yes. I don't know, Inga, what do you think? I think both. I agree. Um, infinite games, you get circumstances you get uh, um, competitors or other stakeholders coming in and going out um, but then a finite game can really help create a safe environment for brainstorming for example so playing a finite game at times really helps to develop something to uh, uh, really uh, get the right insights or develop uh, uh, some sort of idea Right. So I would say a combination, ideally. Interestingly, I know that's one of the things that my entrepreneurship or my uh, uh, creativity students have been criticized for, because we actually do a gaming project where they create a game from scratch. And some of the groups that get criticized the most, most are the ones that don't have a closure to their game. Like the game just can, can, seems to go on and on and really doesn't have a, a, a punchline, as we would say in the, in the, mm -hmm. in the comedy world, you know, and, uh, that's a really interesting thing to look at. Mark brings up a, a, an interesting point, too, that they've tried to integrate some gaming into their startup schools, and they've met some resistance from the players. Uh, so they, you know, he's asking, do you have any advice or experience to share about different approaches to that? This would really be in your wheelhouse, Inga, for <laughs> sure. Yes, uh, resistance. Um, can you tell us a bit more about that? resistance were they hesitant to share their ideas or were they just hesitant to play um what i what i found personally with the playground for entrepreneurs in the sessions that uh, that we do and uh, what our facilitators share is that um of course first they need to get used to the game a little bit they need to kind of feel the safe environment the facilitators tasks is to really uh, uh, um, guard, guard that that safe environment to make sure that it's safe for everybody to share, right, um, right. to communicate those low low stakes and the psychological safety of sharing things, and then people are really willing to open up. So asking the right questions with a little bit of facilitation, if people are hesitant to kind of open up, that really helps. And maintaining a safe environment. So this is a safe environment, a low stake environment in which experimentation is allowed and stimulated. And therefore, people can kind of share their challenges, what they're dealing with at the moment. Uh, also, uh, kind of brainstorm on new ideas. Uh, you kind of get the surprise effect with the different mm -hmm. questions, which is good. A little bit of surprise, not too much. You want people to get slightly out of their comfort zone, but not into the panic zone, right? That the panic zone might add to resistance actually there. Uh, so there's a lot of little things, uh, Mark. Um, I think we, uh, um, if uh, you want, we can exchange a couple of messages over LinkedIn or have a chat about it directly about your experience so that we can build upon that i think we'll close with mike's question which is an interesting one <clears throat> he asks 
yeah. um, you know, are there specific games out there where you can test a business concept within a specific market? Um, I don't know of one. That's an interesting point where a lot of these simulations are a very generalized market. Um, it sort of looks like the whole, it, it looks like the whole world is your market essentially. And what Mike, I think is driving at is, Hey, you know, if I wanted to start a business venture in, um, you know, Indianapolis, Indiana, you know, could I load that market into that simulation and test that concept specifically in that market? Um, I actually think he came up with the million dollar idea of the day. If you could design a simulation where you could actually put a specific market in and it could bring in information about demographics and socioeconomic information and all kinds of different things and actually be able to test it in a specific market, I think that would be a really interesting simulation to run. Yeah, let's let's go to the last uh, point, actually, of, of our conversation for today, I think. Yeah. Um, I think we're just scratching the surface in times uh, in terms of uh, gamification and games in entrepreneurship. There are so many innov in innovation. Uh, there is loads of games like simulations in business schools. But entrepreneurship is something that's just not very much developed in a game type of sense yet. So let's open up that space, right? There is a couple of a couple of simulations. Going back to Mike's question, there's a couple of uh, simulations that I've seen uh, that take into account kind of an SME setting. So they have a scenario for uh, um, for restaurants and for laundrettes and for all sorts of like uh, a very specific small business, but that's like the only thing. Um, and there's also a couple of simulations that I've seen that really focus on startups. So you mm -hmm. get a dashboard with startup metrics and things like that. But that's about as far as it goes. So my question to you also, and how we can develop this further is what's the limit, right? How can we get more advantages and more benefits of game games into this entrepreneurship and startup world because there's so much value to add i don't have the answer right there's no fixed end this is an infinite game right so uh, i don't have the answer but i would love to uh, discuss that uh, individually or or let's see what comes up to kind of open up that space for games and play in entrepreneurship and I think there's a huge opportunity here because with the passion and familiarity with gaming that especially the current generation Gen Z has, we have the opportunity to build better entrepreneurs, to educate better entrepreneurs and, and to really get them involved in this. <clears throat> you know, and we've been doing simulation games forever, uh, yeah. but this is an opportunity for us to really make some headway and maybe bring that failure rate down a little bit by educating smarter entrepreneurs that are able to go out and, and facilitate these ideas better. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, as, as you said, the sky's the limit. Yes. Yeah. And then I see the last question, Stephen's question about a playground for entrepreneurs. So that, for the moment, is, is my contribution to this world of entrepreneurship games. It's really a serious game a coaching tool with uh, people's real projects uh, or students real class projects uh, to actually get to the right insights to build relationships between peers and with, with the facilitator or with the coach and uh, to get to better business models to actually get the insights to get to better business models that's the playground for entrepreneurs but as i mentioned we're just scratching the surface of the potential in games in the entrepreneurship area. So this is this is really the start of it. That's what I what I feel for the moment. Excellent. Well, we are over time again. We always go over time, but we always yeah. have a great conversation getting there, don't we? <laughs> Definitely. We should set the time maybe 10 minutes longer. Maybe, yeah. <laughs> More realistic. And then we would go 10 minutes longer than that. So where does it end, right? See, it's the yeah. finite versus the infinite. Yes. Yeah, yeah. For sure. A little bit of finite and a little bit of infinite. <laughs> great. I hope everybody in the United States has a great Labor Day. 
And uh, for those of you in the rest of the world, have a great Monday, uh, assuming it's Monday where you're at. Um, and we will be back in two weeks again and watch for our announcements on LinkedIn as to what the topic of discussion will be um, next time. And we will let everybody know what we're going to talk about. And I hope everybody has a great rest of your week. Inga? Great. Yes. Thank you. It was a very interesting conversation and um, looking forward to, to the next one. Have a great week. Uh, don't hesitate to contact us if an, anything. And um, yes, yeah, see you next time. Yeah. Take care. Have a good week. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.